Hello everyone. In the previous lecture, we learned the distribution of albumin and saline when you give these fluids to your patient. In this lecture, we'll try to understand how is albumin able to increase your intravascular compartment better than saline and understand the basic physiology behind this. We learned that a gram of albumin pulls about 10 cc of plasma. However, you will understand that the oncotic pressure of albumin is pretty low. So how is it able to pull off this feed? To know why albumin is able to pull fluid into your intravascular compartment, you have to answer four basic questions. First, what is oncotic pressure generated by albumin? By how much does the oncotic pressure increases with albumin infusion? And how does that increase results in increased plasma volume? And finally, where does all that fluid come from? Since molecular weight of albumin is 66.5 kilodalton, a gram of albumin contributes to 0.015 milliosmoles. That means 45 grams per liter of albumin contributes to only 0.6 millimole per liter. That is 0.2% of total plasma osmolality. Please pay attention to the units. Normal levels of albumin is 4.5 gram per dl, but we'll be using gram per liter instead of gram per dl. When you look at the osmotic pressure contribution by albumin, it actually contributes around 0.4% to the total osmotic pressure, which is double that would be expected from its osmolality. And this comes because it is highly negatively charged ion and it's able to hold on to positive ion by using something called gibbs Turner effect. The charge of albumin at pH 7.4 is around minus 16. So let's see what gibbs Turner effect is. Before we proceed, let's understand Van Soff law. Van Soff law simply states that your oncotic pressure will be directly proportional to your molar concentration. Oncotic pressure is nothing but osmotic pressure generated by your proteins and its concept is exactly same as osmotic pressure. So higher the number of moles in your given solution, higher the oncotic pressure. However, when you measure the oncotic pressure, it is much higher than what would be ascribed from a Van Soff law. And this is because of gibbs Turner effect. So let's understand what this is. So let's say you've got intra and extravascular compartment with positive and negative ion. Here, positive ions are sodium, negatives are chloride. Let's see some of these negative ions with negatively charged protein, that is albumin. When you do so, both sides will be electrically neutral. However, there will be concentration gradient for albumin to move towards the right side and concentration gradient of your negative chloride ion to move to the left side. However, chloride ions can easily pass through the membrane, while proteins cannot. So chloride is able to transverse semi-permeable membrane. However, it is going to generate negative charge on the intravascular side. And this will generate an electric gradient for the positive ion. And this is going to attract the positive sodium ions. So your electrical gradient of positive ion decreases while you generate a new concentration gradient on the positive ion. And after some moments, these things will balance out and that is your gibbs tonin equilibrium. At gibbs tonin equilibrium, both sides are still electrically neutral. However, there are larger number of positive ions on the left side. And because there is higher osmolality on the left side, water is going to move from right to left to reduce this difference in osmolality. So when you look at the positive ion concentration in plasma and interstitium, you can see that the concentration of all the positive ions is slightly higher than those in interstitium. In short, Gibbs Donald equilibrium says that product of concentration of positive and negative ion on one compartment should be equal to product of positive and negative ions in another compartment. Gibbs Donald effect increases with square of net charge on the protein. And of the 28 mm oncotic pressure generated by all proteins in the blood, 10 mm is contributed by Gibbs Donald effect. So you can see that despite having low osmolar contribution of albumin itself, the actual osmolality is twice higher. Next question is how much does albumin increases the oncotic pressure when you give these patients 25 grams and this can come from 25% or 5%. So let's find out the new concentration of albumin after you infuse 25 grams. This would be very simple because the final total albumin will be equal to the initial albumin plus the new albumin that you added. Total albumin is nothing but concentration times volume. So your initial albumin is 45 gram per liter multiplied by plasma volume of 3 liters. The new volume is your plasma volume plus 0.5 liters that came from the infusion of your 5% albumin. So you can calculate your N to be 45.7 gram per liter. 
However, the saline part of your 5% albumin is slowly going to equilibrate till around 80% of it is in your interstitium. So final albumin concentration will come out to be 5.16 gram per dl. So an increase of 0.6 gram per dl when you give 25 grams of albumin to a 70 kilo person. When you give 100 cc of 25%, your albumin concentration will be 5.3 gram per dl. So you can also see that the time course of albumin dynamics is important and it finally depends upon the fluid shifts that happens among different compartments. So how much oncotic pressure will increase with 0.6 gram per dl increase in albumin concentration? Each gram per dl of albumin increases your oncotic pressure by 5 millimeters of mercury. Your initial plasma oncotic pressure is around 28 millimeters of mercury. So your oncotic pressure at 5.16 gram per dl concentration of albumin will be 31.2. That means increase of 3 millimeters of mercury. So after you give 25 grams of albumin, your increase in oncotic pressure is only by 3 millimeters of mercury. Understand that the total plasma osmotic pressure is in the order of 5500 millimeters of mercury. So the common thought is that increase in plasma osmolality from albumin will pull the fluids into your intravascular compartment. However, if you look at the numbers, we know that 4.5 gram per dl of albumin contributes only to 0.6 milliosmol. So contribution of that extra 0.5 gram per dl is going to increase your plasma osmolality by only 0.07 milliosmol per liter, which is really nothing. So if you calculate, you will possibly not be able to pull more than few cc's. So let's see what's really happening. In our previous lecture, we understand modified Starling equation where our net filtration gradient was difference between the oncotic pressure in plasma and oncotic pressure in subglycocalic space. And since subglycocalic space does not have a lot of proteins, its oncotic pressure is almost zero. So your oncotic pressure gradient dependent on Steversman constant and oncotic pressure of plasma. Since Steversman constant is going to be constant, most of the net filtration will depend on oncotic pressure in the plasma. So let's see how much will that 3 millimeters of mercury change your filtration rate. Before the transfusion, you can see your oncotic gradient is around 28 and your hydrostatic gradient is around 33 and your net flow gradient is around 5 and at this, your filtration rate is equal to the rate of returns from the lymphatics. However, when you give the albumin bolus, your plasma oncotic pressure is going to increase to 31. That is going to decrease your net flow and your filtration rate is going to decrease as compared to return. However, this is going to re-equilibrate after some time where your filtration rate comes back to rate of return from the lymphatics. Your average pressure gradient for filtration in your body in the capillaries is on the order of 0.3 to 0.6 millimeters of mercury. And this gives total filtration rate of body capillaries or the rate of lymph formation to about 5 ml per minute. And we know that every 1 mm increase in pressure gradient increases your filtration by around 6 ml per minute. So certainly change from 0.3 to addition of plus 3 is in the order of 10 times. So increase in oncotic pressure even by a few points will reduce filtration, but certainly it won't hold for a very long period. See my lectures on Starling and modified Starling equation to understand these numbers in a better way. Another hypothesis is that oncotic pressure generated by this new albumin extracts water from glycocalyx and subglycocalyx space. Various experiments have found this space to contain about 700 to 1700 cc of fluid. So when you increase your oncotic pressure of the plasma, you can certainly extract fluid from this space. However, Dr. Hahn and his team argue that this may not be the case as in their experiments, they have not seen any degradation product of glycocalyx with albumin infusions. One of the other concepts that you have to remember is when you give 25 grams of albumin, theoretically it should pull around 250 cc of plasma. However, this pull is going to be from both interstitium and intracellular fluid compartment and this will be in the proportion of their volumes. So from interstitium, you will be able to pull 80 cc out of that 250 while from the intracellular compartment, you will be pulling around 170 cc. So mostly when you give 25%, you pull more from the intracellular as compared to the interstitial portion. Few studies which have studied the distribution of fluid have reported that around 19 to 20% of the recruited extravascular fluid actually comes from intracellular compartment. One of the other interesting concepts is excluded volume. 
large macromolecules like albumin, they occupy space. And since they don't leak out, the space that they have occupied remains inside and contributes to the intravascular volume even after some fluid has leaked out. So you can see saline compared with albumin. The volume of albumin remain intravascular is higher than the one with saline because albumin has occupied the space. Because of the negative charge on the albumin, it is able to hold on to many water molecules as water is polar and this is called water binding capacity. Water that is in very close proximity to the albumin is called structured water or non-solvent water. In this experiment, they found that out of 27,000 water molecules per protein of albumin, around 1700 are structured and these are non-solvent portion of water. The structured water or non-solvent water is in close proximity with the albumin and would be unable to leak out of your intravascular compartment while the solvent portion of the water is free to be filtered out. When you give 25 grams of albumin, even despite minimal change in your oncotic pressure, it is able to decrease the rate of capillary filtration and it can also move some fluid from your subglycocalic space into the plasma. Since it has got some excluded volume, so it is slow to be filtered out and presence of non-solvent or structured water also relatively increases the volume of your intravascular compartment. So overall, it just means that albumin is able to hold on to water, leaks out less and slows down the filtration from the capillaries. And when you read the literature, you find that this is very consistent. 5% albumin has not shown to pull fluid into intravascular compartment from extracellular compartment, while 20% albumin does pull fluid into your intravascular compartment and we'll see why. One of the things that you'll be very careful when you're reading the literature is the difference between plasma volume expansion and pull from any IV fluid. The net pull from any IV fluid will be equal to your plasma volume expansion minus the infused volume. So when somebody reports plasma volume expansion, make sure that you subtract the volume infused to get the real pull from the intravascular compartment. This is one of the better studies looking at the kinetics of 5% and 20% albumin where the subjects got 12 ml per kg of 5% albumin or equivalent amount of 3 ml per kg of 20% albumin. On the y-axis is plasma expansion minus the infused volume and that gives you net pull or net leak into interstitium. So for example, if you give a liter of isosmotic starch and that liter remained intravascular without leaking or pulling, you will see a parallel line to net movement of fluid to be zero. If you give a liter of saline, we know that around 800 cc is going to leak out. So your plasma expansion is around 200 cc and your infused volume was 1000 cc. So it will flatten out at minus 800 cc. If you look at the 5% albumin, a 70 kilogram person on average should have received around 840 ml of 5% albumin. That means he received 42 grams of albumin. And you can see after one hour, around 400 ml has escaped and out of 840, 440 has remained intravascular. So that means around 440 ml remained intravascular per 42 gram of albumin. That would give you about 10 cc of plasma volume per gram of albumin. And this is the number that we have talked about before. So you can see that the 5% albumin is not really pulling fluid into intravascular compartment. It is just leaking less. And you can compare that to normal saline to understand this. When you look at 20% albumin, a 70 kilo person would have approximately received 210 ml, that is 42 gram of albumin. And after one hour, you can see that extra 200 cc was pulled inside the vessels. You gave 210 ml and 200 cc was pulled. So that means 410 ml remained intravascular after one hour. So 410 ml per 42 gram of albumin, that is approximately 10 cc of plasma volume per gram of albumin. And this we have seen in our previous lecture that this number does not change even if we give different concentration of albumin. So let's see how 20% albumin was able to pull that 200 cc into the intravascular space. And you, you have to do nothing but look at the label on the 25% albumin. And you can see that each 50 cc of this product is osmotically equivalent to 250 ml of plasma. That means if you give 50 ml, the total amount of plasma volume increase is going to be around 250. That means 50 cc of 25% is not going to pull more than 200 cc of fluid. 
and certainly it will be slightly lower than this because some albumin will escape from the intravascular compartment. That's why when you read the literature about 25%, it will always tell you that it pulls through it between 50 cc to 200 cc, that is 100 to 400 percent increase. And amount of this increase will depend upon multiple factors, timing of measurements, volume status of the patient, state of glycocalyx, inflammation, and various other etiologies. In summary, a normal albumin level of 4.5 gram per DL contributes only 0.6 milliosmoles per liter to serum osmolality, and the negative charge on albumin helps further its contribution to serum osmolality by gibbs tonin effect. 25 grams of albumin will increase serum oncotic pressure by around 3 mm of mercury and this will slow down net filtration and may help move fluid from the glycocalic space into plasma. Increased intravascular volume may not be all pull but the albumin's ability to hang on in the intravascular compartment longer than saline and certainly this will decrease with time as albumin leaks out. When you use 25%, it does pulse about twice its volume infused so if you give 50 cc, it will pull between 50 to 200 cc of extra vascular fluid. So clinically, we can use 5% albumin to increase intravascular volume for longer duration because it will remain in intravascular compartment for longer time than saline. And possibly use 25% albumin to pull fluids into intravascular compartment, knowing that it will come mostly from your intracellular compartment and when we need to reduce contribution to interstitial fluid volume. However, in addition to that, we need to answer how long will the effect of albumin last and since albumin also has multiple other functions, will it really improve outcomes for a patient? In medicine, we just don't want to improve a parameter or a lab but want to see improvement in mortality, morbidity and possibly cost of care. We'll talk about more evidence about albumin use and its duration of action in the subsequent lecture. However, the final takeaway I think which I learned from this was whatever the underlying mechanism, it does appear that each gram of albumin given to the patient should hold on to about 10 ml of plasma for at least few hours. But does this increase in intravascular volume improve their outcome? Will be discussed in the next few lectures. These are the references. Thank you.